When you hear me going on about esports pools, you might think to yourself, okay, sure, it can be fun to play there, you know, could give it a bit of chance, but it's not just a game of chance, is it, Thorin? You know, there's, it's actually a game of skill as well. You have to know what players to pick in the fantasy sports part of it. You have to know who, who the odds favour and are the odds worth it for that price to know if you've got a good chance in the long run of making some money off some of these bets. So, okay, okay, fair enough. The thing about life is, and one of the secrets to gaining wisdom, not just knowledge, but wisdom, is you've got to understand how to interpret the symbols of life. These condensed sort of points at which certain principles are focused and the way they play out in the world can tell us something about the way we could live life or model or conceptualize life or how to go about succeeding. I mean, take this guy, for example, okay? Take the rabbit, okay? See him here? See this rabbit? Now, the rabbit, of course, a uh, symbol, perhaps, of a creature that, you know, he's he's earthbound. He's, he's on the earth, but he's close to it, like us, you know, moving around. But he goes down into the underworld. You know, he digs a, a burrow. He goes under down, and he goes down there. And this, you know, think about the underworld as the unconscious. Think about this as reaching into the intuitive part of yourself. Because that's what you're going to need to do if you want to combine the, the luck and the fun of playing at esports pools. But you want to make the right picks too. You want to have a feel for who the game is going to be. Of course, it's easy to be a rabbit, you know. I mean, it'd be better if you could just catch the little fella, right? Hey, oh, there we go. You've been down there in the underworld, have you? Yeah, finding out who's going to win these games. And then off comes the head, yeah. You'd get his little head, wouldn't you? He'd rip it off his body, yeah. Don't smell like chocolate, don't worry. Uh, you'd get his little head, and then you'd smash that fucking thing in. Yeah, you'd smash it in. It'd make it easier. You don't want to be nibbling on him while he's moving around and that. You'd get that, and then all that, oh, that all that delicious knowledge. Oh, mm. All the knowledge of who's going to win the bets and all the rest of it. Mm, mm, I think Apex is going to do well in this next fancy tour. That'd be the best, wouldn't it, if you could just do that every time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In play betting. In play betting. <laughs> the laughing doesn't help. That's just, it just makes it more fun. Seeing the way people think about and model the great players of today really makes me think back to some of the greatest players of all time. And in fact, in Couch Shock 1.6, the famous discussion of who is the best player of all time. And that involves Forrest, the Swedish player of teams like Fnatic, SK Gaming. And then you have Neo of all the Polish sides, basically the same core, the Golden Five, going through many different organizations. Because if you ask any CSGO fan now, and even some of them the end of 1.6, They'll make it clear that, okay, maybe it isn't decided, actually. Maybe they have a preference, or maybe they think they're both kind of like co- or joint best player of all time. But you look in the modern day, and you see players like Cold Zero, like Nico, who for the last couple of years have been in position to be contrasted and to be considered who is the best in the world, who's going to be the best player ever in CSGO. And I've noticed people don't have consistency with how they think of those old great players and how they contrast their careers with the current ones now. Because, okay, Forrest and Neo, yeah, probably the two greatest players in CS history. They both have majors under their belts. They've both won other titles. They both dominated individually at different periods of time. They both have a lot of consistency, dominance, and high-level play and success, team success, individual success over many years. They have longevity to go along with consistency tournament to tournament. They have year after year after year so not only in a year will they be good for eight out of ten tournaments but you can bank on two or three or four or five or six years in a row where they're some of the best players in the world then you add in okay they played with all-time great teams they played with some really great teammates but they are the only common denominator in all those lineups is neo and is someone along the lines of forest obviously then finally, obviously, they are acknowledged by their peers. Now, that one is a bit more iffy. There are definitely sports and, and uh, esports where sometimes peer groups, I think, overrate certain people or give someone else credit who was like the second or third best player on a team where that doesn't make him better than the star player of a, a guy who didn't win but was on a much worse team. But then when we talk about these players together, you'll start to see some of the differences in the fact that, hey, would someone really have thought about that guy today in that way? So let's contrast them as we will in this video, not separately, but we've got to talk about them together and what they represent and relative to each other because <clears throat> that discussion and narrative around them as rivals for the best title of best player in the world, best player of all time. When you unpack that, 
you will find the model, uh, the key rather, to how you model CS. Because here's the thing, both of these players can absolutely legitimately, with different criteria, be considered the greatest Counter-Strike player of all time. As, by the way, and this is something I referenced in an article I wrote for Fragbite, can a player called Potty, who for the first half of the 12 years of Counter-Strike was the guy winning the most and the guy with a very consistent game and the guy with a killer clutch instinct that was just went beyond above and beyond everyone else. You know what, at a stretch, you could even try to, if you want to talk about years of excellence, you can look at people like Element, this is a guy who had a lot of success in vastly different teams and playing different roles and going all over the place and had an individual game that wasn't as flashy and filled with frags, but could control and have insane impact on a game. Then you think in the latter day of people like Get Right, an amazing rifler for the last couple of years, the best Swedish rifler, arguably. Then you had Markolov, who for at least a year and a half, two years, was unbelievable in terms of individual performance and was probably the biggest, you know, kind of big game player who you know would turn up in all those big finals. And in the the big map you needed to be dominant or to come back in a series so in terms of neo and forest okay the talent level is amazing they have mvp type performances all over the place for years with consistency with that said i actually think neo is the one who the consistency stands out even more because this guy legitimately did have like five years or something where five five and a half years where Every one of those years, you can make a case he was a top five player in the world. And some years, he was the best, or he's the second best. So that ability to not just be consistent and very good, but elite and consistent is unbelievable. Meanwhile, okay, Forrest had a, a few years, let's say three years, where he was godlike. 2006 to 2008, he was unbelievable. His individual ability was incredible. His ceiling was nuts, and he would hit that ceiling often. You look at some of the other ones, okay, yeah, later on in the game, people like Get Right came along, people like Mark Love came along, which kind of threw a spanner in the works over the last couple of years, because those guys were very good, at times better than these guys, you can think of that with what Simple's doing at the moment now, or in the past when there were other players before them who were incredible, but you know what, even with these players, Get Right, Mark Love traced to some degree, but didn't have as many titles, still... The key point is Neo and Forrest were always there. They were always right just behind these guys. They were consistently there. They were there before them. They were there during them. And so they have the longevity and kind of the, and the, the, the criteria that nudges them past those guys. And again, makes it just about those two and deciding which one for you. So again, it's about what criteria you're going to choose and how you model the game. Because personally, I didn't want to just look at titles. Because you know what? Just looking at the titles doesn't even work. Like, for example, Neo won more majors, many more majors. We're talking like double or more than Forrest. But you know what? Forrest won probably double or more non-majors of the other tournaments, the medium-sized events, the ones that don't have the World Championship label. I mean, it's not an official label, but attached them in the same sense. Then again, you have to add in, though, it's not just about titles, though, right? Because Neo's teams, pretty much all of history, except maybe the latter half of 2011, were actually worse. They weren't as highly ranked. They weren't the number one team in the world almost ever. They weren't the team that was the favorite to win these finals or win these tournaments themselves, yet they won more of the majors. So, okay, kind of cool. At the same time, makes sense they wouldn't win as many of the non-majors, right? They weren't actually as good as teams. But that also means if you're the star player and you're the primary carry, you get a lot of credit for these big titles you win, right? And that shows that not just your individual player was amazing, but the impact it had was in unreal. Then you got to add in, Neo's team was an underdog or even money for the majority of the major finals they played in. They were not supposed to win most of them. Three quarters to four out of five of these majors. They were not, well, four fifths, let's say, because they didn't play five. They were not supposed to win the majority of these tournaments. And they won the majority of them. It was the other way. It was inverted. They were winning three quarters of all the majors they were playing in, basically. Meanwhile... Forest teams were in a lot of major finals. Forest teams were, in the majority of them, favourites. They were practically never underdogs, very mild underdog at most in a couple, and yet it's the other way around for him. Despite being the favourite most of the time, he lost most of the time. Over his whole career, he won three majors. And this came, by the way, two of them, when he got Get Right as help. Neo never had a player as good as Get Right. Then you go and look... He had one early on in 2006, well, late 2006, but early on in his career. And then he had one in his absolute prime in terms of best team he was on. I wouldn't say for his individual peak when he was on 2009 Fnatic. And then he won one going sort of out the door with the SWC 2011 when he was in the SK gaming lineup. 
So you think about how different these players' careers were and where they excelled and the different types of backgrounds they came from. Forrest had a lot of talent, a lot of teammates, a lot of great help, a lot of great teams he played for, came from a country with a background in Counter-Strike excellence. Neil comes from Poland, who were nothing before him in Counter-Strike. He never really had a lot of great teammates. He had some that were good role players, but not like star players and star talent around him in terms of help in that particular sense. Then you go and you look at someone like well, the success they had, okay, Forrest had a lot of success in smaller tournaments, a lot of top placings, didn't get many of the majors though, and not even the majors where he was the big favorite, the pressure was on him, Neil got most of the big majors where all the pressure was there, and even actually when his team wasn't expected to win, and actually it's amazing they even did that. Now you go and look at how people talk about Cold Zero and Nikon. By the way, before people get into this, people can talk all the shit about me and the way I model the game and think about the game because most of them don't realize how often they are parroting my words and my characterizations of these all-time great players from videos or articles or things I did around the scene then to chronicle the scene when no one else was doing that. When the people who watch those games don't watch the game anymore. You, don't, you won't find those people anymore generally. And so... The way I've characterized things is the way people pick up a lot of this stuff. And so, because I was there writing articles, analyzing, etc., people will often repeat the analysis that basically was my analysis, that Neo's the best overall player. He won those majors. He was the guy who had the best all-around game. He was a hybrid player. He could use every weapon. His individual impact in every game was insane. He could change up roles. He won big tournaments he wasn't supposed to win in terms of his teams. He had way less help. People now kind of accept, yeah, Neil probably was the best 1.6 player. That wasn't what people used to say at all at 1.6. There was a very healthy amount of people. It was it was close to a 50-50 split who thought Forrest was the greatest player ever, who thought Forrest was the best player we'd ever seen in Counter-Strike and his ceiling was so amazing. How could you deny it? And who cares if he didn't win all the majors and titles? Still an amazing player day to day, sure. So what's funny is for me... Ignoring all details, you can't take every factor in because no player will be identical. But if I had to contrast the two, okay, Neo is basically the cold zero of his period. Now, in context of the game, Neo's a much more skilled player because in 1.6, you... It, and in a weird way, you could be a little bit more individually skilled in the game and in terms of overall impact. So it doesn't quite match. But in terms of what I'm about to explain, which is that Neo, like Cold Zero, had that ridiculous consistency. You know, every game he's going to turn up. Every game he's going to be a threat. He's never going to play badly himself in theory or choke or get two nerves in theory. And it doesn't matter whether it's a game in the final of a major or it's a game that's just a one-off best of one against your rival in the group stage. He's going to turn up. He's going to have a really strong game. He's going to be a an amazing player. Meanwhile, Forrest actually fits a lot more in the vein of Nico, where you think to yourself, okay, amazing ceiling. Okay, when he hits it, seems unbeatable. No one can stop this guy. Doesn't always hit it though. As amazing through tournaments and then sometimes isn't as great in the final. I mean, you look at some of the other people, it's harder to put other people in categories, like maybe like Simple's more like a Zet or something like that. When you add in the personality, the drive, the contentiousness of who he's like as a player, but the insane skill level, that uh, the fact he has to play free form, but when he does, he just takes over the game. So, okay, the style part's obviously not going to work entirely, but you know what? Forrest is a godlike player, yeah? In fact, without Neo, we would say Forrest Clay, the best player of all time. And in fact probably the best player most of these years, and what's even in the discussion, whoever's next closest, people would go, oh, that's not really comparable, right? It's the same thing with Nico, right? The last, over 2016 and 2017, if Cold Zero isn't there, Nico's hands down the best player. Nico's the best player, especially once he gets to phase, where people will be saying he's the best player in the world. It wouldn't matter that he might not have always done as well in some of the finals. By the way, he would have won most of these finals in a world where Cold Zero doesn't exist, remember? It's guess K who's playing in like half of them. Then you consider, they're both, both Neo and... Nico, uh, no, both Nico and Forrest have the same exact problem in finals. They're not as spectacular. Now, they're not shit. They're not all choking all of them. That's a ridiculous mischaracterization. But they're not as good as they are elsewhere. They're not that dominant player that they often are on other occasions. They have the odd final where they go super ham, but mostly in the final, yet something seems to get to them. A little bit of pressure or something about they don't have the same internal confidence to make the same kind of plays and hit their ceiling as often, whatever it might be. This is the funny thing, is that Forrest gets away with it. No one brings this up. No one counts that against him in this competition, except me, apparently. And what's funny is both of them have the same problem. If you put Neo in a final against Forrest, I'll put all my money on Neo. I know he, Neo's team also has to win the game for him, but Neo will outperform Forrest in all the majors he plays him, against him in. I've seen it happen. Likewise, who's going to outperform Nico in all the finals he plays? Well, 
Cold Zero is your only sure bet. The other ones, it's a lot more touch and go. It depends on Nico on that day. Obviously, the other person has an amazing game. But if you put Cold Zero, yeah, Cold Zero probably is going to outperform Nico in most of the vials he plays. It's got a different type of a game. And yet, whereas people go, that means Cold Zero is by far better. And it's not even really that close as to where the Nico is. People have no problem considering Forrest could be better than Neo and could be as good as Neo, could be a greater player, could actually have qualities that make him better. Because what's funny about Forrest and Nico in this sense is they are so unreal elsewhere that they get the similar numbers overall. That means they might be more exceptional against different types of opponents or lesser opponents or in the tournament that isn't a major, but they might be better in that tournament than the other guys. How else do you think they get the numbers? How do they get the same plaudits? How do they have the same focus and the same quality about them, the atmosphere where you know that that's an an incredible player who can take over the game. So it really makes you think about what do we value in the game? What, how do we contrast these things? It's not as simple as reducing it down to one factor, going he won more titles or he won more head-to-heads or his skill is more or his consistency is better. It's all of them at the same time. And then it's figuring out a delicate balance of how they interrelate and how we stack and prioritize them. Because it's not as simple as getting the one priority. It has to be about which ones we favor and how much, what percentage. I give this one 70%, ah, this one's maybe 25% in Inclusion overall, and then we can get a sense. And let's never forget at any point in time, the discussion is real. It's never as simple as this guy is clearly better. That's not the case when you get to these ra this rarefied air, the stratosphere of the super, super, superstars, the greatest of all time. So just as with Forrest and Neo, it's a great discussion to have. It's one of the best you can kind of have over a drink, going through all the old factors, trying to pick someone's brain or attack them on a certain angle. Likewise with Cold Zero and Nico. Hello, this is Neo, just an average CSGO player, and you're watching Florin's YouTube channel. This video was supported by Dean Tanglis, Michael Allaire, Andreas Westerland, Alex Adams, G-Man, Twitch Twitch Twitch, Jerky's Minion, Gianfranco Ingrata, Anthony, Bash, Tigreb, Jordan Tsenkov, Daniel Yordanov. Want to suggest guests or topics for my content? Well, keep it G-rated and unlock the code to the streets, gaining exclusive access via the Patreon link below. The Skrilluminati grows daily.